Thank you to all of our panelists and our wonderful moderator for your reflections. I would now like to introduce you to our next group of speakers who will be addressing the need for federal action for climate justice and health equity. Dr. John Bowles is the Interim Director of the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. A physician and public health professional with over 25 years of experience working on the health implications of climate change, Dr. Bowles has served as an HHS Principal to the U.S. Global Change Research Program and Co-Chair of the Working Group on Climate Change and Human Health for the U.S. Global Change Research Program since he joined the federal government in 2009. Before coming over to the new office, Dr. Balvis served as Senior Advisor for Public Health to the Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Dr. Kyle White is a George Willis Pack Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan, teaching in the Environmental Justice Specialization. His research addresses the environment addresses environmental justice, focusing on moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous people, the ethics of cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and science organizations, and problems of indigenous justice in public and academic discussions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and the Anthropocene. He is an enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. And lastly, this panel discussion is being moderated by Dr. Georges Benjamin, nor known as one of the nation's most influential physician leaders because he speaks passionately and eloquently about the health issues having the most impact on our nation today. From his firsthand experience as a physician, he knows what happens when preventive care is not available and when the healthy choice is not the easy choice. As the executive director of APHA since 2002, he is leading the association's push to make America the healthiest nation in one generation. Dr. B, take it away. Hi, Tia, thank you very, very much. Um, and welcome everyone. You know, you've heard a lot this morning about the impact of climate change on our health. And I personally believe that climate change is the greatest threat to human health we have today. You know, I recognize the role COVID-19 pandemic has played. Um, and of course, that, that impact has been huge. But climate change will dwarf the COVID-19 pandemic by several magnitudes of scale. In fact, as the Lancet Policy Brief points out, this impact is enormous right now on our health and it's occurring today and is inadequately being addressed. Now, this new report from the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change takes a focused look on the role our delay in addressing climate change plays every day in warming the planet and its direct visible impact on our health from wildfires to droughts to air and water quality. And of course, climate change is making us sicker and less safe than ever before. Of course, there is a federal role in addressing this problem. Uh, and President Biden actually made a strong commitment to address climate change when he signed what was a comprehensive executive order in January uh, of 2021 that directed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to establish an office on climate change and health equity. So we're here today to discuss the role and impact and the potential impact this new office can play on our national efforts to address climate change. So with that, let me turn to, um, um, to uh, Dr. Balbus and say, John, you know, what are some of the ways this office can work to fulfill the administration's Environmental Justice 40 directive? Thanks very much, George. And thank you to the organizers of the panel for having me uh, on this today. Um, so the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity is organizing its work around three broad priority areas. The first is our, our mandate to protect the health of Americans in the face of climate change health threats especially those most vulnerable. We're also working to address um, you know, health disparities and the social determinants of health to the extent we can from our office through climate actions that are being done in other sectors for mitigation and resilience. And then the third broad area is to work directly with the health sector on resilience and decarbonization. So in each of these three areas, we see our office aligning closely with the goals of the Justice 40 initiative. 
Now, there are two spe specified pilots for HHS in the Justice 40 initiative. One is the NIEHS worker training program. The other is to enhance uh, the LIHEAP program, the low income household energy assistance program for cooling, for protecting against heat stress. And we are um, consulting with the LIHEAP program, providing some technical assistance to ensure that, that they are reaching the communities um, as much as possible that are bearing the greatest burden uh, and the disproportionate burden of, of heat stress. Um, but we have a lot of other things that we're going to be doing that I think align with the Justice 40. Uh, and, and a challenge of a small office uh, you know, within the Beltway is how do we actually partner with and, and reach and hear from and empower the communities that are, are most burdened by existing health disparities and by the health risks of climate change. And we're trying to do that through our, our regional offices, which have a lot of existing infrastructure, which already bring together the different parts of health and human services and other agencies um, and already have partnerships with community-based organizations. And we'll be working with them to, to have two-way communication and have an action agenda, not, not a listening session because we've been listening for a long time. We're ready to, to actually target um, the, the actions at, in, into the places that need it most. Um, in our work with the healthcare sector, we're mindful of the need to assure that resources that we put into decarbonization of facilities and moving from on-site fossil fuel combustion in health facilities have to prioritize those communities that are already bearing disproportionate air pollution exposures to particulate matter and other forms of air pollution. Um, and then as our office develops, we're going to be creating trading opportunities for underrepresented minority scientists and health professionals in accordance with the goals of the J40 initiative as well. So we're not just working on policy um, and not just working across HHS and the federal government to inform climate change policies with a health equity lens, but we're also looking to invest in, in people uh, and in activities that will empower and raise the voices of the most burdened communities. John, thank you. I think we all look forward to working with you on that. Um, Dr. Cow, you know, how can this office um, you know, leverage the enormous knowledge base that endogenous communities already have, um, and then work with those communities um, to address climate change. Absolutely, I appreciate the chance to speak to your question, Dr. Benjamin. It's first important to note the different meanings of indigenous knowledge. And one important meaning is that for generations, well before the United States, diverse indigenous people, such as my tribal community, Potawatomi people, we had our own rigorous knowledge systems that we used to survive, uh, to flourish. Uh, and oftentimes we have stories in our communities about previous historic periods of having to address different forms of climate change that affected seasons, that produced extreme weather events. And our knowledge systems, because they have a different origin, than some of the more dominant science traditions, they oftentimes don't disentangle health, culture, and climate change. In fact, in a lot of indigenous uh, cultures, our knowledge traditions spoke about the fact that you couldn't really detach the climate system from the health system. And so many of these traditions endure and persevere even to this day, and many communities rely on their own knowledge systems for preparing for and addressing climate change systems. And so I think that's one of the first steps is just to acknowledge the, the history of our knowledge systems and the fact that actually our knowledge systems were interdisciplinary before interdisciplinarity became a thing in many do dominant scientific fields. And so oftentimes there aren't gonna be terms that cleanly distinguish between something that's climate related and something that's health related or something that's cultural or something that's physical. Another important aspect is that our knowledge systems, and this is kind of another step, oftentimes we rely on them for our day-to-day -day information and our tactics for survival and our methods for flourishing. And so indigenous knowledge systems are oftentimes able to identify the places where people are exposed to risks at the intersection between health and climate change. You know, for example, indigenous knowledge systems oftentimes speak to the ways in which traditional activities or harvesting or other subsistence activities are actually activities that put people in places where they're exposed to different types of climate change related risks. 
And so appealing to indigenous knowledge systems is enormous for actually being able to discuss the health impacts, the health risks that indigenous people are facing with respect to climate change. Another step is also to understand that in a lot of indigenous knowledge systems, and this goes more broadly to the issue of working directly with tribes, climate change is traumatic <laughs> for many of our communities. You know, we watched a lot of our lands be completely dispossessed from us, went through assimilative schools, had multiple environmental burdens and uh, assimilative practices imposed on us, and now we have climate change. But this is not the first time we faced human-caused climate change. We also faced it when the fossil fuel sector removed us from our lands and our territories or shrunk them exponentially to make way for those industries that we now know are responsible for the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so I think it's important for agencies, uh, especially those related to health, to really work with indigenous knowledge systems and all facets of those knowledge systems, including the fact that we know a lot about how to succeed legally and politically and socially. We have a tremendous knowledge of just how our communities work and the adaptive strategies over many generations that we've taken to be able to maintain our continuance as people, despite the discrimination and hostility that we faced in the past and that we still face today. Dr. Cal, thank, thank you for very much. So we really need to take a much more holistic approach to this. This is what I would take away. Thank you. So the brief really focused a lot on heat um, because we, the, the brief wanted to make it real to people. And of course, in, increased heat exposure is one of the most critical problems that we're seeing with, with climate change in many of our communities. As, as someone said the other day, um, kind of the heat dome within the heat dome. And these increased exposures are due to um, things like uh, redlining and other policy decisions that were made that um, created communities that are not being well supported. Um, the brief also talks about air conditioning as an example of uh, life saving adaption that, of course, is um, available during extreme um, heat events, but also recognizes that that adaptation may not be available for everybody. Um, cost of doing it, um, including the electro. Um, the cost of electricity, the energy costs um, involved in that um, can be a real challenge. So let me ask each of you um, what the um, some ways that this new federal office um, and, and in fact, any of the other federal agencies can do to help work to address this. And John, let me start with you. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a, a good example of how we need to solve our problems now and in the future with new thinking and not the thinking that got us into the problems in the first place. So, you know, even as, as we've discussed, we're working with the LIHE program to, to try to make sure we get the resources to provide cooling to keep people's electricity on um, in the face of an extreme heat event in the, in the near term. Um, you know, that, that we recognize this is essential to save lives here and now, but it's also not the solution for the long term. You know, expanding this endlessly so that we're just putting a lot of money into air conditioners is not the solution to climate change health threats. And so as part of this, our, our office is co-chairing a new heat working group that's bringing together federal agencies to coordinate across what they each bring. Um, both for the immediate response, the short-term response to a heat crisis, but also to the longer-term responses like electrification and weatherization of homes uh, and, and, and you know, passive cooling and also urban heat island mitigation or other forms of, um, of uh, built environment mitigation to reduce, uh, to reduce uh, heat, heat exposures. Um, and this is gonna help save energy reduce costs and ensure that we thrive in the long term. So we're, we're working to enhance preparedness and response in part by expanding the time scale of advisories so that it's not just a heat wave tomorrow, but, but giving longer term several week, you know, seasonal or monthly forecasts, um, working with our interagency um, national integrated heat health information systems, which, which um, has been around for a few years. Um, and we're also reaching out to cities, uh, you know, and putting this together now within this working group to explore pilots and other kinds of integrated planning activities that would help to connect the resources and programs that are being developed and, and, and expanded uh, to like the FEMA BRIC program and other programs that, that 
uh, are providing resources for improvement in built environments and to be able to both target them again to the communities that are already bearing the disproportionate burdens of heat stress as well as the multiple other um, cumulative stressors. Um, so get them to the right place and you know connect them to the places that are experiencing the greatest burden of, of heat illness so that we start to reduce the exposures through means other than air conditioning over the long term. Thank you. Dr. White, same question. Absolutely. As a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and also a frequent contributor and author for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, I've had the chance to work with a lot of agencies on health and climate change issues. And with respect to heightened heat exposure, I think one of the key areas, and I appreciate that the question referenced redlining, uh, one of the key areas is that a lot of people in agencies are not familiar with some of the land use policies and some of the laws and the history of how tribal lands have been divided and demarcated. And this is also related to the history of infrastructure disinvestment in indigenous communities, as well as the barriers to uh, improving infrastructure and doing so in ways that accord with the sustainable values that many uh, enrolled members of tribes hold. And so, for example, uh, Native people experience heightened heat exposure, both in terms of their, their housing situation, but also in terms of some of the activities that they do as part of their subsistence and cultural uh, activities. And it's important to note that it's not a matter of Native people being in the wrong place at the wrong time, but there's a history of different forms of land dispossession that have limited Native people's access to lands, that have limited the types of infrastructure that are available on tribal lands, as well as have excluded Native people from decision-making uh, about issues related to their health and well-being. And for example, a lot of folks that I work with, obviously with the exception of colleagues in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, aren't familiar with some of the issues of treaty rights or trust land or reservation land or service areas or the difference between uh, 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 Alaska Native villages and other uh, tribal government designations. And similar to something as complicated as redlining, these different land use policies are at the heart of why Native people are exposed to height heat exposure and other climatic risks. And we need to understand and reform them. And agencies have a big role to play in order to lower vulnerability. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those, those are basically insightful comments. Um, so I, I just want to give the, uh, a great deal of thanks to our two panelists, both uh, John and Kyle. I appreciate your efforts. And Tia, back to you. <laughs>